All right, thank you, thank you for checking in with us. Um, at this point, I'm going to move on to the second topic of the agenda, which is to move to have an interview of sorts with uh, Ricardo Fluffy Pony Spagni. He is uh, obviously the lead developer of Monero, right? Right. Uh, I'm pretty sure. Obviously, that's know. still the main title you go by. Lead maintainer. <laughs> you know, lead maintainer is probably probably closer to reality than developer. I know. I know that's something that you typically correct people on in all the podcasts. They're like, this is the founder and lead developer. He's single handedly putting new blocks on the Monero chain. Yeah. Uh, of course. It's, it's like EOS, but you know, with one person. <laughs> yeah, it's decentralized, though, of course. Totally. <laughs> all right. So, um, Ricardo, can you kick us off with sort of the very early history of Monero? How and why did it start? What drew you and others to the project in the first place? So I, I think, I mean, as in preparation for this, I went and looked back at old IRC logs. I have IRC logs from 2013 and 2014. So it's super convenient because I can actually go back and like read the stuff and it's been, you know, just, just the past couple of days, just digging into those logs. And I mean, it, it's, you know, it's very dense. So I, I certainly didn't read everything, but um, there were some highlights and some, some choice things I picked out. So I figured like what would be really um, interesting is, is to give people a little bit of background um, and then sort of tell my personal story. Obviously there are people at the beginning that have other personal stories um, that I'm sure they, they will share over time as well. But um, so just, you know, sort of a little bit of background is uh, CryptoNote was um, the white paper that Monero was originally based on. Um, and CryptoNote started off as like good in theory, but it shipped with this like really badly done scam coin. Bad and not from like a coding perspective, although that was another story, but badly done because the whole scam was hey guys, we've just discovered accidentally, by chance, this cryptocurrency that no one has heard of, but that has been in existence for several years. And it's been in existence on the dark web, and that's why you haven't heard of it, because nobody's gone on the dark web and discovered it. Um, which, of course, everyone that read that was like, but we've gone on the dark web and we've never heard of it. So the scam kind of started falling apart from the beginning because you can't pull the wool over like everyone's eyes, just ask Craig Wright. Um, and, uh, and it sort of started to, to get a little bit messy, but part of the scam was, and we, you know, we sort of discovered this over time was that they were going to release a bunch of, uh, of forks. And then the forks were going to sort of just provide additional, I guess, provide additional income because they would be able to, to, they would have all this knowledge and they'd be able to mine it much faster than everyone else. Um, or at least with, you know, they, they'd start mining it much faster than everyone else. At any rate, what they didn't count on is human ingenuity um, and uh, the ability for people to like make good of a bad situation. So in many ways, Monero started off on this really rocky foundation. So there's this guy called Thankful for Today total sock, sock puppet for the crypto node Bitcoin scammers. And thankful for today goes and launches the first fork of uh, this crypto node reference implementation. And he calls it BitMonero, which in um, Esperanto literally means Bitcoin because Monero means coin. So, you know, not a, not a fantastic name, but that aside, um, everything else, you know, like is fairly good from a launch perspective. He announces it on Bitcoin talk a couple of days before the launch. Um, he tries to make binaries available um, uh, and, you know, like make sure that uh, that he's around to provide a little bit of support. Um, so, you know, not bad from a launch perspective apart from the general scamminess. And very quickly, I mean, I like, I went and actually checked my logs and this is now, uh, let me actually open my logs so I can make sure I'm accurate. By the time like April the 27th rolls around, um, we're already in our own chat room on Freenode, so we've already moved from BitMonero to Monero. Um, and I mean, this is, you know, April 27th is what? That's like, you know, less than 10 days after launch. Um, and, uh, and we're already having like a big disagreement with him. 
So, you know, really within two weeks, uh, he'd already lost control. The community had effectively, uh, they'd effectively been a coup and he was ousted, not, not in a, um, not ousted in sort of like a, you know, you, you don't belong yes sort of way, but more in a, well, we're doing this thing. You can go do your thing. Um, and let's see who follows us. And of course the community in its infinite wisdom decided to follow a bunch of randoms who had no idea what they were doing instead of the guy that launched it, which is of course interesting because, you know, you would expect it to have gone the other route. But just some, some choice things. So some, you know, my personal journey began um, when uh, the, the, the crypto note um, thing was uncovered and the whole like dark web um, uh, launch, secret launch, or the, you know, not so secret, whatever thing was, uh, was revealed. And, uh, these are the logs from, from RSC and I get this like message on RSC from a guy I know quite well. And he says, morning, did you take a look at crypto notes? So I'm like, no. So he links me to it. Um, and he says, well, it's based on ring signatures for transactions, making it anonymous could either totally fail or be the next big thing. So. I went and read up a little bit and I was like, oh, you know, this thing's kind of interesting. And, um, and, you know, looked at the, I looked at the, the code and it was clear that it wasn't based on Bitcoin. And I said something that, you know, like, like really, uh, stuck with me. I said to him, oh yeah, the problem will be that it's not Bitcoin or based on Bitcoin. So everything has to be re-engineered and little did I know that what that actually meant you know, for me was that I would be the one like getting stuck in and trying to help people re-engineer stuff. Um, you know, I thought like, oh, you know, this is interesting. Other people will go and re-engineer. And I never expected that I would have to go and herd cats and do a bunch of stuff myself. Um, other choice bits that are interesting from Manura's really early history. So this is 27th of, of April. Um, is after launch, we have this bot in the channel called Bot Monero get it because bit Monero and uh, you could query bot Monero and you could ask it things like what's the current difficulty what's the current block height what's the estimated hash rate so 27th of April and the hash rates about 7,400 hashes per second so I mean like it's like let that let that sit in your mind for a bit um, because you know Monero currently I mean the the mining network even before we uh, had a six on the network, even before we forked in, before we did any of, any of that was significantly larger than 7,400 hashes per second. Uh, also same day, 27th of April, um, this guy called zone one, one, seven X gets invited into the channel. Uh, he was the, is the developer of NUMP and, uh, there's this whole discussion about, Hey, so, um, there is no mining pool software for Monero, um, or for crypto notes in general. The only way you can mine it is solo mining with the CPU, not with the GPU. And there's this whole discussion of, hey, would it be possible to add support for Monero to NOMP? And this, this very serious discussion about how very dif difficult this would be because none of the RPC calls are the same. Everything is different. Uh, fast forward to the next day, the 28th of April, the hash rate has gone up to 9,300 hashes per second. Um, the 28th of April as well was interesting because um, th that the uh, there was an OTC market that started on Bitcoin Talk, and by that stage, 28th of April, um, I mean the first OTC trade was on the 22nd of April. So you know the OTC market had been running for a little bit. For those that are interested in price, the very first um, OTC trade recorded for Monero was a thousand Monero that was sold for 0 0.5 Bitcoin. Um, at the time, Bitcoin was at about $500. So that means uh, they paid about $250 for a thousand Monero, uh, which is now worth $70,000 um, if they held on to it. Um, and uh, for those interesting, or for those interested rather, uh, it was A's who bought the 1000 Monero. And who did he buy it? I can't even remember who he bought it from. Oh, he bought it from Noodle Doodle. So, I mean, this is like super early on. And then 29th of April, we broke 10,000 hashes per second, which was really, uh, you know, monumental in our minds. Um, and then last sort of interesting tidbit from Monero's really early history was the 30th of April. And again, this just really goes to show how little we knew and how 
we were we were still so inexperienced in many ways. Um, it was thirtieth of April Taco Time, um, who Taco Time was really the guy that did the actual act of forking the Monero repository on GitHub. So um, Taco Time was logged into the Monero uh, project account, um, or had you know had set up the credentials for the Monero project account on his computer. And he's not familiar with uh, with Git at all, and he's trying to get Git working, and he's trying to, um, you know, like commit stuff and submit a pull request. Um, and anyway, he ends up messing it up so badly that the Monero project GitHub account opens a pull request on the Bit Monero uh, repository, um, on the Bit Monero project GitHub account. It's still there today. It's the second pull request that's open on the Bit Monero project slash uh, Bitmonero uh, repo, it's still open. You know, I mean, thankful for today, just never, just abandoned and never, obviously never merged it, but never closed it either. Um, and it's pretty hilarious. It's like this weird piece of history where we were just like, where Taco Time was super confused about Git and ended up opening this pull request in the wrong place and totally the wrong way. And it lives there in perpetuity. I don't think anyone's ever going to log in and close it. So that's like, yeah, I mean, that's, that's like super early history. That's April 2014, five years ago, when we knew nothing. We had no idea what we were doing. Um, I, I thought at the time, I mean, I'd like read the white paper, um, didn't understand half of it. I mean, I understood some and then didn't understand other important bits. And somehow, in my mind, I thought that ring signatures applied to outputs and not inputs, which is a story for another day. So, I mean, it was really early days. We were super confused. We didn't know what we were doing. We were picking up all these pieces that other people had dropped. Um, and it was it was an interesting time. There was nothing, really. I know that you've described the, the sort of the acquisition of Monero as someone depositing a baby on your doorstep. And you, you take this responsibility because you assume no one else can do it better. But sort of at that moment, how did, can you walk us through how you sort of went through the process of essentially triage. Okay, you have this cryptocurrency. How do you prioritize what really receives work? Like, how do you, how do you, how did you even figure out what needed work? And how did you determine what to put your efforts to? And how do you find people that can even work on that? Can you walk us through that very in first initial exploration process? Sure. So, so we were blessed with a couple of things. Um, the first was we had Taco Time and Noodle Doodle who were um, super willing to do work and to, and they were like extremely talented C++ developers. Um, you know, for all that, that uh, Taco Time couldn't figure out how GitHub worked um, or Git, like he was really good at C++. So we had this initial spurt of like very basic things that needed to be done. So as an example, there were no Mac binaries. Um, in fact, it didn't compile on Mac at all. So one of the early things was like, you know, just knuckling down, getting it compiling on Mac. Um, and then it's like, cool, now we've got Linux working, we've got Mac working, okay, we're sort of getting there. Um, it was working, oh, it was compiling in, on Windows in um, uh, C++.net. Uh, so, I mean, that was a whole thing as well, because like you've basically got this entirely separate build infrastructure for Windows, which is in this like fantastic IDE, and then everything else is command line, and it's like super trippy. One of the things that was really difficult for us as well is there were no code comments. Uh, and I mean, literally no code comments. It, it was actually as if someone had taken the code that, that a bunch of people had worked on, full of comments, and they'd gone, let's strip out all the comments before we make this available publicly. So that was really difficult because you had no idea why certain decisions were made, what the thinking was, what the reasoning was, why, you know, like where to find things. Everything you wanted to know, you had to backtrack. You had to go and like dig in, oh, this class is like references. Okay, now we got to go to that class. Like you had to, I mean, you just lived on the command line in grip trying to find things all the do, time. Do you, think that was, do you think that was essentially deliberate for the point of trying to prevent someone else from taking the code and maintaining it themselves? Do you think it was trying to, to literally prevent exactly what you did? Um, I suspect, it, I suspect so. I mean, I've been thought about this. I mean, why would anyone strip out code comments if not to infuriate anyone that's trying to work on it? It was almost to make, to, to keep them as the, um, the, the center of truth, the center of knowledge. Like, 
you know, anything you want to do, you can't really do it, but they can do it because they have access to the like original source that is full of code comments. Um, and, and so that was, you know, it, it felt a little, a little cruel. Um, and it also led to, to some people being publicly infuriated by the code. Most famously, Peter Todd, who um, took a look at the code, tried to dig in a bit, and then eventually just said, I'm sorry, I can't, uh, publicly. And uh, it was, you know, you sort of look at that and you're like, okay, like, why would anyone do that? Well, obviously, it's, it's, um, it's to retain control. Um, and to, to really think about how much adversity the developers, the community, everyone had to overcome um, is phenomenal. Um, it's, it's re I'm really just proud of all the effort that everyone put in. To, to get back to your original question, though, uh, how do you decide what to work on? So, you know, there were several major problems that we identified early on. The first was the blockchain was in RAM. So that meant that the blockchain could only grow as big as the memory on your computer. Um, and then periodically, every eight hours, or however often it was, yeah, I think it was every eight hours, it would save that blockchain from memory onto disk. Um, and then when you quit, it would also save it onto disk. This was, of course, ridiculous and unworkable. Other things that were really interesting were um, that, uh, you know, th there was no like mnemonic system like we have today with the seed words. You would create a wallet, it would use two random keys. And then if you ever got rid of that wallet file, keys are gone forever. No way to recover them. Um, there was also no like plain text way of saving them. You literally had to save that file um, in some sort of non volatile way and hope that you could recover it in future. Um, other issues that we had uh, were no pool, no pool software, no way to mine Monero except Solo mine, no GPU miner when the GPU miner was cle clearly possible. Um, what else was was painful? Uh, no GUI, no GUI. Oh, that was the other one. Man, people complained about that a lot. Um, so we sort of tried to tackle a million things at this time um, because, again, you know, it's this nascent project. We don't really know what we're doing. So we're like, okay, um, you know, oh, we need a GUI. And so we start on that. And then at the same time, someone else is like, oh, we need pull software and sort of start down that. And so you're trying to just like, get to all these things at the same time. And then we, we tried really hard. And I think after like six, seven, eight months, really towards the end of 2014, that's when we really got hard with ourselves. And we were like, okay, some of these things are just not going to happen. So we scrapped the GUI software. Um, for, for the moment. We did the, we, at that point in time, we had the designs ready. We had um, this basic framework that was compiling in Qt. Um, it was almost ready to start hooking it up. We just didn't have the time. We didn't have the resources. We didn't have the energy. Um, pool software was more important. Uh, GPU mining, well, you know, somebody would work on that. Eventually, Wolf worked on it and, you know, stuff started getting released um, at some point. But it was really... It, it, it was really difficult at the beginning. Um, it, everything was painful. Everything required like in-depth research. And I'll give you a classic example of, of this. And that is the, the blockchain in RAM. So the blockchain's in memory. We need to get the blockchain out of memory. It's not feasible for it to be in memory. Um, and there's t a super big time constraints on this because once the blockchain starts hitting like four gigs, then even if you have more than four gigs of RAM, you can't save it to disk on 32-bit systems. So, you know, we, we've got a limited time frame for 32-bit systems. And obviously, I mean, especially in 2014, how many people had more than like four gigs of memory? You know, I mean, that, that was not that common. Um, and uh, a lot of people who did have more only had eight gigs of memory. So we would still have a problem like pretty soon thereafter. So, you know, we're, we're sort of trying to tackle that. And then we go, okay, so we need to have this blockchain in a database. What should that look like? Um, well, okay, what does Bitcoin do? You know, it's the first question we always asked was like, what does Bitcoin do? Okay, Bitcoin um, did level DB and then they, or Berkeley DB and then they switched to level DB. So should we do that? Is this a good choice for our workload? You know, because we, we don't, we weren't really very big on like not invented yes syndrome. Um, Taco Time had contributed to Bitcoin um, and uh, had a bunch of runners of his own. Um, and, and obviously like other people just came with, with sort of a more fresh approach, uh, but everyone had a great deal of respect for what Bitcoin had accomplished. And so it was like, okay, what did Bitcoin do? 
should we do it differently? And if we're going to do it differently, why? So one of those early discussions was, um, was around the database. And um, I went and, and did a bunch of research and I found this thing called HamsterDB, which seemed really interesting because it had like the free open source version. And then it also had a closed source um, version, which was slightly faster, or I think significantly faster, which was great for, um, you know, like enterprise environments. So I thought this was kind of a nice mix because you can have the open source one that everyone runs. And then if you are like an enterprise environment or uh, let's say an exchange or a mining pool or whatever, you can then go and use the, the faster commercial version and go pay for it. Um, and, and in this research, I came across the, this one set of benchmarks and it was like comparing all these like level DB forks and hamster DB and some other things. Um, and then like, it, it had this weird thing called LMDB. And in like some of the benchmarks, LMDB just blew everything out the water. And I was like, whoa, this is, what is this thing? Like, why is no one talking about it? Everything that I read on embedded databases is like level DB, level DB forks. Um, and then occasionally a couple of others, oh, you know, SQLite, it's the other one that gets thrown in all the time. And why is no one talking about LMDB? It's so weird. And then I went and like checked the LMDB, uh, like went and did an actual search for LMDB um, uh, uh, things like p comparisons that people had made and where they'd actually, they'd given it actual workloads and they'd benchmarked it. Um, and I found like, you know, a couple of, of people who had written things where they like, they were critical of LMDB. And then, then a couple of things where people had like lots of love for LMDB. And so I was like, you know, this, this is really interesting. It's kind of like the underdog. And I have like, and I, I guess, you know, I mean, I have an affinity to underdogs in a way. Um, I guess that's why I started working on Monero in the first place. And so I was like, well, maybe what I'll do is I'll get a hold of the developer and I'll just ask him and I'll say to him like, hey, we want to use um, LNDB in a cryptocurrency. Like, what do you think of it for our workloads? So, you know, I managed to like figure out that he was on IRC and I sent him a message and it's of course, it's Howard Chu, Hike, HYC. And so I sent Howard a message and I was like, you know, again, I've got these early logs where we're having this discussion and he's like, yeah, huh, cryptocurrency, you know, you'd see he's kind of mad at it. Um, and uh, he gave me a couple of pointers. And so then we started building, we, we, we were not confident in LMDB at all. Um, and so we started building like LMDB as like the main one, but like a level DB backup, you know, so like that we could just use rocks DB or something if uh, LMDB didn't pan out. Um, and so we had this blockchain DB generic class and then specific implementations. And uh, we started building this and then we'd get stuck with some stuff and then I'd ping Howard and I'd be like, Hey, you know, like we're a little bit str struggling with this a little bit. What do you think? And uh, he'd pop into Monero Dev on RSC and he'd help us a little bit. And then he'd disappear and uh, we'd carry on. And then I think just by like pulling him in the whole time, eventually he got so like interested and excited that he's become a major Monero contributor and a, a major part of Monero's ecosystem. Um, and it all started from like those early discussions of like, hey, we'd like to use the thing you built. Um, and, you know, not asking him for help really in terms of like implementation, we did that, but asking him for just pointers, yeah, and pointers there. Um, and it just goes to show that like people fall in love with Monero. They fall in love with this project where it has just, it has heart. And I think that that is, you ask, how do you attract people to, to work on the project? And I think there is, there's no other way to describe it. The thing that Monero has, which most projects do not have except for bitcoin and a handful of others is a heart and and you just if you get to know it especially from a development perspective um especially in the early days where there were no code comments the test framework was kind of mature but still didn't implement a bunch of things um there were no builds for like a bunch of platforms everything was terrible um the code was awful in many ways but you fell in love with it because it was like this piece of clay and you could, you, you look, you had this lump of clay and you were like, I can see what the pot looks like when I'm done. If I put it on one of those um, big rotatey things and I have a bunch of water and I pour the water on it and I mold it. And then someone comes behind me and puts their arms around me whilst I'm doing that. I will end up with this lovely vase and you could see that. Um, you could see the potential, but that's all you could see because everything was a mess. 
Um, and just falling in love with it at the beginning with this lumpy piece of clay, I could see that happen for other people and, and for, other, for other developers that pitched up that wanted to work on it and that have stuck around for years, um, not for personal gain, but just out of sheer interest in what Monero can be. Awesome. So we're about halfway through, so I'm going to move on to a few other questions. Uh, but the first one I want to ask is, if you had to do this entire process all over again, I know it would be a rough process, but what do you wish you knew when you were going through this process that would have helped you out a lot? Um, that's a good question. I, I think... I wish I, I wish that I had, I mean, obviously I wish I had the knowledge now that I had then. Um, I wish I had known what people wanted and needed um, out of the software early on. Um, you know, we had to bash our head a lot um, in terms of figuring that out. And it's, it's been equal parts rewarding and challenging and frustrating. Um, but I really wish I knew what people really wanted because it's um you, it's such a hard thing to read you know people complained about the gooey the gooey the gooey and they need the gooey they want the gooey and it took us a few years to get it out because we were, we were so prior to, we prioritized security and, and just getting things working and when we did release it then we had a lot of really positive feedback from people that were like cool the gooey and then also just a bunch of like negative feedback from people are like, this is not what I expected. You know, like I just wanted the thing that would start up and work magically and not run a full node. Um, and it's, you know, like, it, like, I don't know. I mean, maybe if we knew now or we knew then what we know now, maybe what we would have done is just like put a gigantic pause in things and be like, look, these are the 10 things that we need to do before anyone can use Monero. And between now and then, like the only way you're going to use it is the command line, and that's it. Tough. Um, we're not going to have easy access tools. Our time frame on getting these tools out to you is like five years. Like deal with it, and and maybe that would have been a better approach um, instead of chasing our tail constantly. Um, I I also think that we've spent a lot of time getting a lot of hate um and a lot of negativity from people for various reasons uh, monero just is that project that some people love to hate whether it is because they're in competition whether it is because they're jealous um whether it is that they legitimately believe their thing is better i don't know and i don't really care but we've dealt with a lot of hate uh, like more than usual i mean i'm used to hate on the internet I'm used to people being like massive douchebags and eh, it's fine. It's water for ducks back. You don't like survive on the internet unless you can take a bit of abuse. But Monero has really had a lot of aggressive abuse hold at it, um, a lot of unnecessary uh, public abuse. Um, and we've survived through all of that and prospered. Um, but I wish that I'd ha I had known then what I know now because I probably would have been able to like bolster things and, and prep us at least mentally and emotionally for some of that um, because we were not prepared. We thought that everyone would love us and think that we're the darling of, um, of new tech because we're helping people, it's privacy, it's great. Awesome, so can you explain a little bit as Monero got larger, there was a, a a requirement that you really understood what was going on with Monero's code and how to improve it. And of course, you also had other sort of work groups of sorts. You had other coalitions of people that came together to, to negotiate things about Monero's protocol and how Monero did things a little bit better. So can you walk us through the initial formation of the first few work groups, the, the, um, the Monero economic work group, and the Monero Research Lab. How did that sort of get off the ground? And what was the real importance in Monero's legacy there that these were started, even if, for example, the Monero Economic Work Group isn't really a, a thing anymore? Sure, so I think, okay, so, you know, taking one at a time, the Monero Research Lab, um, 
was formed because like again you know we felt um as developers um that I mean, we had some really amazing people you know we had smooth who is um an absolute genius and you know like i, I can come up with this like harebrained scheme and be like what did, like what if we did this and we did that and then this cool thing did that and then smooth will just take one look at it and be like oh yeah but that's trivially trivially broken because someone can do this Ding. and then it's like oh okay yeah i can see how that's trivially broken um so you have him and you and we had like taco time who also just came with this like incredible deep knowledge of cryptographic systems and how everything back fits together um but we lacked i think formal acad academia um and so one of the things that i did really early on was i was like okay we, yeah you're right we need we need some formal academia involved in particular we need to understand this white paper properly um and so i went onto reddit and i went onto i think it was the four higher subreddit and I Googled for like mathematician and I came across this guy um, and he was offering um, maths classes and uh, you know, offering assistance with homework and stuff like that. But his credentials were pretty solid. So I sent him a message and I was like, hey, so we can't pay much, but we can pay you a little bit of money um, to like annotate this white paper um, and that, that we have because we don't really understand it that well. And he was like, um, OK cool and this was brandon um saray and he was like okay i like that's cool i can do that and this is much I'll, I'll charge you and you know we came to an agreement there and then like he sort of started and he was like well i've got this friend who's more familiar with cryptography um and what if he helped me and we did it together and uh, I, I think we didn't even like change the rate in fact they gave us the same rate um you know for both of them to do it um and it really it was such a small amount of money it was ridiculous but like they were academics at university and, and like we needed the help and they needed that little bit of money and so everything sort of came together uh, anyway his friend was sarang um and so they both got involved um and like at the beginning like we had this discussion about when you publish this because they started working on it we said like when you publish this what what name are you going to publish this under and he was like i don't know let me go and speak to my advisor and i'll come back to you so he spoke to his advisor and his advisor was like oh cryptocurrency yours can be a little bit dodgy uh, maybe don't publish it under your own name you can always go and like later on and be like oh you know yeah i'm connecting my real name to my pseudonym and so we decided we needed a pseudonym so i said to him okay you know why don't you guys come up with a pseudonym scheme and you know then we can do that so he was like, okay, cool. So he went away and came back and he said, they've decided the pseudonym scheme they're going to use is their surname is going to be Notha um, and their first name will start with an S. So they're going to be Saray Notha and Sarang Notha. Great. So that was really the start of the Monero Research Lab uh, with the two of them. And shortly after they, they, not that shortly, I'd say, you know, within a few months of them starting and doing this great big annotation of white papers, um, we came across uh, this other guy who pitched up and wanted to like help contribute on the research side. And we were like, well, you can contribute on the research side, but then you need to join the Monero Research Lab, which is like this open collabor collaboration. And if you're going to do that, you need to have a first name that starts with S and then your surname needs to be Nota your your, for your pseudonym. And he was like, okay, I'll be Shen, Shen Nota. Great. So now we had three people um, and, and that's sort of like how it snowballed. Um, and it was just this like these people that would like speak a little bit to each other online and bounce ideas around. Um, and then I went to um, Salt Lake City in Utah and uh, flew Saray Sarang and Shen all into Salt Lake City. Well, I think Shen, stayed, or Shen was nearby and whatever. Anyway, they all came and we hung out in Salt Lake City for like a weekend um and uh, drove around I, I was there visiting my business partner um, and he had an audi tt and it was hilarious because like we crammed into this audi tt and at one point it was like i think there were like four of us no five of us in an audi tt that car does not have a lot of space i don't actually know how we managed to fit in there and of course being south african like you know i'm i'm not 
that familiar with mileage and like how much mileage you get when you're measuring miles and your gas is not measured in liters. Um, and uh, my business partner told me that the gas gauge was broken, but I like forgot. And so he was like, you probably have like 100 miles or whatever it was. And I totally forgot. And we ran out of gas on the highway. And thankfully, it was like near an uh, near a, a slipway coming off the highway. And we sort of just ground, like, like rolled to a halt on the side of the highway. Um, and the Monero Research Lab and I had to walk to a petrol station and get like a little thing of gas and go back up and like pour it into the tank and then drive the car down to like fill it up properly. And that was early, that was the first Monero Research Lab meetup where we, again, you know, like just had no idea what we were doing and no idea what we were getting into, but we were trying it out and it was fun. Um, the Monero Economic Work Group was interesting. It was a couple of people in the community that were very interested in um, who was going to provide input to Monero's economy. And when I, when I say economy, I think their primary goal was the um, design around um, the emission curve and, and what, if anything, changed with that. Um, also, like, you know, could there be subsidies for uh, participants in the in the community? And they had, uh, in the economy, rather. They, they had really good intentions, but it's, you know, they, they had this idea, like, you had to pay to join the Monero Economic Work Group, and then there would be meetings, and there would be votes, and all sorts of stuff. And the biggest thing that they that they didn't realize, and this was a massive early lesson in, in, in governance, was that they have no control or influence over what the developers do. So some of the developers uh, were members of the Monero Economic Work Group, but when the Monero Economic Work Group took a vote on something, they actually were powerless. It's not like they could force the developers to do anything. Um, and so it was a really good early lesson on that. But what was really powerful was that the Monero Economic Work Group formed itself. There was no pushing, there was no, no one forced them to exist. Um, and they were self-governing, they were self-assembling, um, and they, they just carried themselves. Um, and they eventually disbanded for a bunch of reasons. Um, I think probably because, you know, charging to be part of a work group is not the most sustainable way. Um, but it was still very, it, it was a, a fantastic early model that started to develop this idea of self-assembling work groups. Monero Research Lab had been self-assembling, not initially. Initially, I'd gone and found people, but then Shen pitched up, and then a couple of other people pitched up. Um, and, and it, you know, the Monero Economic Work Group was self-assembling, and so this formed the basis for what we have today, which is anyone can pitch up and form a work group. You want to do marketing? It's no problem. Form a work group. And that's why we have the Monero Outreach Work Group. You're worried about attackers and hackers? No problem. Form a work group. That's why we have the Monero, uh, the, the VRP Work Group, which is the Vulnerability Response Process. Um, you're worried about malware? No problem. Like, let's find a way to tackle it. That's why we have the Malware Response Work Group. So anything thing like that you can imagine people can form work groups for even the developers now are broken up into work groups you have developers that focus on the core code and that's like the core development work group you have developers focused on the website that's like the website work group you've got developers focused on the GUI that's the GUI work group you've got developers focused on translations and they've got their own work group with their own tools that they use so work groups have been incredibly powerful especially for managing um, different groups of people that want to do different things on this open source software and this ecosystem at large. Excellent. Thank you for the perspective on sort of Monero's community organization. On, on a similar note, um, you are a member of the Monero core team. We have, uh, you know, another member of the Monero core team on here, Arctic Mine. We can speak to him in a few minutes. Um, but can you quickly describe the role of the Monero core team and how this has evolved over time? What do you see it? What do you see the role of the core team being now? And how do you expect it to progress into the future? Sure. So the, the core team's initial role, I think, was um, to shoot Monero. Um, and so that meant a lot of things. Um, it meant writing code. Um, Taco Time wrote a bunch of code, Noodle Doodle wrote code, I wrote code, everyone wrote code um, that could. Um, and then there was this other role, which was like 
obvious stuff like owning the domains. Who owns the domains? Um, who goes and owns the GitHub account? You know, how, how do we like prevent that from getting compromised? Um, and if we can't prevent it from getting compromised, if it does get compromised one day, like, you know, who, who takes responsibility for that? Um, and, and there's got to be some central cabal of that. There's no way to really do that in a truly decentralized, community-led way just yet. Uh, you know, you can't have a domain that's owned by a community at this stage. Um, so, so, you know, those are the basic things that, that, um, that they do. And really, I think the initial role was um, stewardship. And stewardship at that early stage meant a lot of do it yourself and a lot of go out and find people and ask them. So like the Monero Research Lab, those early days where I went and found Saray and Sarang, well, found Saray and Saray asked Sarang. Um, you know, those early days where it was like, like they, they didn't, dis they wouldn't have discovered, I mean, they might have discovered Monero, but chances are they would only have discovered Monero much later. So them discovering Monero early on was because as a core team, we identified a need and went out and found it. Um, that, that has changed significantly. I would say as a core team now, we maybe have, <clears throat> we have some, uh, our voice carries some weight in, as individuals. There's no doubt about that. But I mean, there are people who've been around for a long time whose voice carries weight and they're not part of the core team. Like Monero Moo, like Hike, um, you know, like a bunch of people. Um, so it's not, it's not that it's, that's the defining factor. I think literally the only thing that, that really the core team does nowadays is owns the GitHub repo um, and owns the domains and then handles financial stuff, very limited financial stuff. So paying for like the build servers um, and paying for like the CDN and a couple of those things. You know, we like someone's got to pay for those, and we pay for those typically out of general donations. Or more recently, um, we, we've got either um, donate or that is sponsoring the server that uh, the Monero website and, and a lot of the key resources are served off of. And then Tari is sponsoring the CDN. Um, we haven't really started speaking about that. It's something that's just changed over the past couple of months. So we haven't needed to tap, needed to tap into the um, general donation fund for that. Um, but beyond that, there's nothing, you know, we don't make decisions. Um, we don't really decide anything. Um, as individuals, we can participate in things. So um, apart from my role in the core team, I'm also the lead maintainer, which is a separate thing. Um, and so as the lead maintainer, I make suggestions about when we branch, when we tag releases, and all I make are suggestions. You know, if I say I think it's a good idea to tag on Tuesday and everyone says, no, it's a bad idea, we should tag on Monday, I'm going to tag on Monday. I'm not going to do what I want to do. Um, so there's, you know, the, the roles are, we're, we're almost put in place or we have authority that's relative um, and it's relative because it's, we're given that, that authority by the community um, when we don't have, we're not self-authorizing, we're not, uh, you know, we, we can't go and just do our own thing. Um, and really, given Monero's history and what happened early on, it's we're in a, a position where if we take one false move and we aggravate the community too much, they will just fork away from us. They'll fork away uh, from the core team and go set up different domains and, and different GitHub repos. Um, they'll fork away from the developers if they don't like what the developers are doing. So our power and authority is relative and we're very cautious and careful um not to overreach um we have no control and that's the way we like it we're, it's not centralized in any way which is the way we prefer it all right thank you so much uh ricardo fluffy pony um i'm glad that we were able to just sort of touch the surface here on some of monero's early history we really didn't get into anything really outside of 2014, um, apart from a few things looking forward with the core team. So um, I'm glad you're able to set the perspective on Monero's early history. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and having that discussion with us.